I'm not really sure how we're supposed to to start these these new interview series. This is the second one we're doing, so there's still sort of a work in process. Uh, if you're listening to the audio only version of this, this is Jesse Anderson. I am Quackalope, and today I'm having the opportunity to talk with Sami Lasko, uh, a Finnish designer uh, from Snowdale Designs. He is the creator of Dale of Merchants and has Dale of Merchants three. Uh, coming to Kickstarter here within the next week. We'll be covering stuff here on the main channel. Just so everyone knows, this is a a work in progress. So if you hear dogs barking in the background or or I stutter or stumble along along the way, uh, that's just sort of sort of part of the process. Sammy, thank you for or Sami, thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate you being here. Uh, go ahead and set up before we get into an in-depth dive into your thoughts around design, kind of where you started and start talking around the nuance, go ahead and set up what Dale of Merchants is and, and what this kind of world or, or card system that you've created is, is all about. Yeah, D Dale of Merchants is a deck building card game series and currently it has three games and the fourth one, as you might expect, is named Dale of Merchants 3, which is pretty natural, isn't it? So the first one is one, two, then there was a collection and now it's the three. So we like to name the smaller boxes with the numbers. It's a uh, deck building card game series. And one of the main things is that the uh, series is, has a lot of hand management, which is not found in usually in deck building games. And uh, there's also what we call uh, anima folk decks and they're all themed in a different ways. Some are more random, some are more interactive and vice versa. And you only pick few of those decks in any given game, so you can really suit the game to your either to your game game group, which ever you're playing with, or just your mood if you're up for some relaxing playing where you can't really mess with other players too much, or if you like me, you like chaos, you can just include all the all the nasty decks and have some pretty crazy fun. Now, one of the elements you just touched on there is one of the things that I think I was most impressed by when I first discovered and started playing uh, Dale of Merchants. So Jan has been a big fan for quite a while and was actually very familiar with the IP when when uh, I first found out about it. Um, but it wasn't until I sat down and started playing. You have a very classic deck building sort of system, right? You're, you have a marketplace, you have resources, you have cards that spe have special abilities. That if you like deck building games, that's going to be established. You're going to be familiar with how that, that core system works. The crazy thing is how many decks do you have now that mix and match and integrate that make the play experience unique? I mean, based on what animal folk you're playing, how many are there total? 27 after the of Mercy 3. <laughs> and which you is, only which use is crazy. the player count plus one. So in two player games, you use three decks. <laughs> Yeah, which is which is absolutely crazy um, because the amount of mixing and matching and integration and the system you have for determining if it's going to be random, if there's going to be high player interaction, and if it's going to be kind of luck based or or high str strategy, I I think that's really really cool. And Jen and I have sat down and played around with decks with various kind of uh, mixing and matting pa matching patterns because I like messy games. And you have the opportunity to control the type of environment you're playing in, which is something that I, I don't know that I can say about a lot of other deck building games. Yeah, the origin story for that is that I wanted to design a game that I would like to play uh, all over again many, many times, countless of times. But also I would like to play it with my sister and she's really picky on what she plays. No, in the, no, no stealing, no, no, no chaos, and pretty much uh, you, she she likes to build her her own stuff and things like that. So I designed the game from the ground up to be a really modular, so you got really uh, sweet the game on based on who you're playing with or which kind of game you want to play at the moment. So that's the the uh, I, it just came from the need for me to want to design a game that I could play with pretty much anyone. So. That's that's the story behind that one. And then combined with that, someone, I mean, if people are familiar with Quackalope, they know lore and theme and, and flavor are going to be kind of a shining cornerstone of the things I talk about. The The artwork here is primarily done by you. I think there's a few cards that you didn't officially do, but it's your style. It's your world that you've built out here. Uh, it is it is beautiful and and really, really thematic. But the thing that I personally like the most is that all the decks 
are designed and, and graphically designed around the animal folk that they're that you're playing with. So you can really see that narrative come through this marketplace where they're bringing what they have and trading and presenting and, and sort of bartering back and forth. But then you also have mechanics that feel appropriate to the creature that is playing them. Uh, I love that not only do you have this unique system that you've built out, but you've also spent the time to make sure that the the animal creatures and the folks you're interacting with feel like they really would be acting in that way, whether it's a monkey stealing something or uh, a, cl- a cat being sleuthy and kind of and kind of maneuvering around the board in unique fashions. Um, how do you go about choosing what animals you introduce into the core game? Uh, and when is a duck coming? That's a core question that I need to ask. I will answer that first because in the developer's <laughs> collection, there's a character card which is uh, actually two characters in one, uh, two characters in one card. So the, uh, they're breaking that rule or from the get go. But it's two ducks on that one on one character cards. Okay. So it's, well, it's all right. So there is. Uh, we'll talk about a, a Quackalope expansion deck sooner or later. We'll get there. We're just starting this relationship. But no, I really love to know. How do you go about selecting what what animals are going to be introduced into the world? And how do you go about tying it? Does it start with theme and mechanics? Does it start with the animals that you think might exist in this space? What's that thought? Pretty much all the decks in the series uh, have first came up with, I, I, I came up with a mechanics I wanted to introduce. And then I built a deck around that. And as soon as the deck is even barely pay- playable, we brainstorm with it with our team so i can't take all the credit for the world building we have uh, actually a team of three to four or however depending on how you count it uh, on working on the on the world where the game sets sets place but after the after that uh, we have uh, i have decided that the deck will be released in some way or form in some expansion at some point then we brainstorm which animal would fit this mechanic so an example is I'm a, a deck that where you are constantly looking at what other players are doing, and as soon as they do a specific thing, then you have, aha, I have a card that lets me do uh, something because you just bought a card from the market. So they are owls because they're always, always mm-hmm. observing what the other players are doing. And so it's about, about that we want to make the decks as easy to remember on once you have played once with Ocelots, you remember that they are the chaotic folk who roll the die and have fun all the time. Uh, or when you have played once with the kangaroos, you remember that those are the guys who love to protect their own valuables so no one can steal their items. So it's, uh, and then we build a build and think how how those uh, animals would build a civilization or how how would their uh, community work together if if there was a bunch of raccoons who are always stealing stuff from others well then we came up with that they would be some kind of nomads that don't have actually own country and they are moving from place to place and living living where under the other other folks and stealing their stuff and basically thinking which would make sense thematically for the mechanics and which would make it most easy for players to remember what deck was uh, does which kind of thing so let's rewind just a little bit i I i've started diving into some of the questions i'm curious about around dale of merchant specific but we'll get to those i'd like to rewind a bit something that i'm not as familiar with i'd love to know about your history what your experience is uh how you kind of ended up here with Snowdell Design? Like, wh- what led you to game design and working on this? You talked talked a little bit about playing games and and wanting to be able to play a game with, with people like your sister and your family. So I just love a little bit of that kind of background. Yeah, I've, I've played all my life, basically. So as little as, as was, we ha- we always had board games uh, in, our, in our family, and we, I played with my, uh, with my siblings and uh, designed designed some <laughs> some games even even in as li- little i was was so like copies of other games with no unique things in them but many many things many do i think and then i uh, at some point i established my own company where i i just designed websites and created websites of other play, uh, not players but other companies and other people and then in 2014 or something like that i just had an idea 
that it would be, be fun to just create a game that I could play with my family, with my friends. I didn't have, I didn't think that I'm going to even release it. I just wanted to design a game, so I could say that I did did so and have something unique to share with my with my close ones. And because everyone I played with uh, with the, uh, uh, the game Day of Merchants, uh, they liked it so much. So I thought, well, why not try to try to kickstart it, see if other people might enjoy it as well. And and uh, after Delmers 2, because the first one was so well received, uh, I had done board games full time and haven't done uh, website websites since then, uh, except my on my own. <laughs> That's fantastic. So first off, congratulations on on all the success. Success. Uh, second off, when it came to that first Kickstarter, the first rendition of Dale Merchants, how much? development, prototyping, playtesting, like the official terminology that people think of when they go to Kickstarter nowadays, because the marketplace has changed a little bit, right? People want to know that a game has been through the ringer and is basically at its finished point and all you need is money for manufacturing. With that first game, was the was the culture different? Was the environment different when you brought it to the table? It was a little different, but not that's that much, but I think it that your project needs to be even more shinier, even more polished, even more finished artwork and th things like that. But I'm not sure if the game uh, at the bottom there in the in the, the core needs to be that much different from from that time. But definitely you need to uh, polish it a lot more. So for the Elmer's one was uh, kind of weird in a way because I had just some ideas. As I told already, that I wanted a game that I can play with anyone, and then mm -hmm. I just thought that maybe maybe I could design a deck builder, and maybe I could could design even a deck building game that I liked because I haven't played any that I did did like at that point. So why not create a game in a genre that you hate? But well, well, so I had I just thought about different things like multi-use cards and. Uh, 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 high high replay value and how how, how and tough decisions and things like that and the game just almost kind of fall uh, from my head to uh, to the table in the components uh, in just a few days and after that it was months and months and months of playtesting and refining the card effects basically but the uh, pr basic rules of the game the core of you can play this card as an effect or into the stuck to the uh, in your stall to get closer to victory. Those basic rules are pretty much all from the fir first version of the game. And then it's just uh, basically refining and refining the effects to work around that core. But I was surprised how well the main game worked <laughs> just from the first play session onwards. Now, you mentioned something really interesting there. Uh, you, you said you designed a game around a core concept that you didn't necessarily enjoy that much. What are the games growing up that you played the most? What are the things that you sort of sourced inspiration for? And why in the world did you design a deck builder if if it's not your style of game? What was the thought there? I like challenges. <laughs> That's fair. And and I could pinpoint uh, certain things in the deck building genre and the games in general that I didn't like, that I thought that just small tweaks could make it in a way that I would enjoy the game a lot more. In in my childhood, I played a lot of different games like mass market games, uh, Ticket to Ride, and and uh, Mon Monopoly, but not that smart. But uh, shout out to Ravensburger and their uh, children's games. They are excellent. They are di they are for different age age group like eight plus and ten plus and things like that. Th those were our favorite games when we when we grew up. But for Dale of Merchants, I just uh, basically two two rules that I uh, changed, which changed the uh, game from what I'm actively disliking to I'm actually loving this game, is that you're, you don't discard your hand at the end of your turn, and you get the new cards straight, straight into your hand. Those are the two rules that I always, when, when people introduce new deck building games, and they have those rules on the other way, discard your hand and place the new ones in your discard pile. I'm, uh, I'm not going to like this one <laughs> because they are, the meaningful decision in those games is which card you buy. I wanted more in the, uh, more meaningful decisions on what I want to do with my cards. Do I want to save them? 
uh, which accent do I want to use each, each specific card in my hand and things like that. So yeah, there's that... more, more meaningful in, uh, decisions outside of what cards I will purchase from the market. That that gentle shift in the in the mechanical order um, gives you so much more control over the strategy throughout the course of the game. And with a game like yours, when it comes down to reacting to the decks that are in the kind of in the mixture, and then also planning and and hopefully getting things to your stall potentially a turn or or less before your opponent is able to, uh, those decisions, those strategic choices that you can make throughout the course of the game matter so much you need to outthink and out strategize and hold on to specific cards to get your numbers where they need to be to be able to kind of get to victory condition yeah um, both both that and comboing cards together so in many games that i played i just hope that if i have this card and the other one at the same time this is so great combo i want to play this all the time but yeah. i first i draw the first one and on my second turn i draw the second one I and I can't blame myself for not drawing them at the same time so that's I, I wanted to players to be able to combo the cards any way they want no that's cool too because those combos are oftentimes some of the best moments or best experiences in the game so you're giving the player control and agency over some of the most rewarding parts of deck building games I think that's really awesome what has the the journey been like from the first Kickstarter from Dale of Merchants 1 uh, all the way up through to the collector's edition, which has entirely unique components in it and, and, and guard systems in it as well, uh, up until Dale of Merchants 3. What have you learned along the way? Well, there are tons of small, smaller things here and there that you learn. But I have been fortunate in a way that I have prepared for all the campaigns and all the game, uh, game releases quite well and uh, written a lot of blogs. Uh, for example, shout out to Jamie Steckmeyer's excellent Kickstarter Kickstarter blog. So I could avo avoid many many pitfalls when uh, by learning from other other uh, creators' mistakes and trying to avoid making making the, those mistakes myself. But some uh, uh, let's what what would be some examples of some major things that I have learned? Maybe. maybe Prepare. Uh, one thing is that I try to prepare the game even more uh, before Kickstarter than earlier. So there's a delicate balance of how ready the game is once you go to the Kickstarter, because you want some sort of uh, community feedback and being able to react to that, so because, so people can feel like they are almost part of the journey of the game in some way. But having too much leeway can easily delay the project really much if you aren't quite sure how to end, finish up some, some things and you have too many loose ends. So I'm trying to uh, figure out what's the best way for me to balance, balance those the completion is, uh, and the, making the game as ready as I can, but still having some uh, feedback and building community with the, with the backers in the, in the meantime. And yep, there's a whole, sure. whole, dis whole different discussion about stress goals and exclusives, which I have decided to drop altogether. But <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a shift that I think certain sections of the community have started translating into. So, getting into the act of design itself, you said those the, the core framework of Dale of Mergence was sort of established from from ground zero, and then it came to refining and and playing with that kind of frame that you have there. Uh, what is the design process like now compared to when you first started? Um, what have you learned as a as a designer, as a gamer, as a player over the course of, uh, f you know, soon to be four successful series in this? And and I, you have a few different games as well uh, out. You have Dawn of the Peacemakers, and then remind me, do you have other titles? Those are the two two titles so far, and next the next four one that series I... in Dale. Dawn of the yeah. Peacemakers, and then one that's in the process right now. Yep, that is correct. So what have you learned along the way as a designer and as, as a gamer? Well, at least as a, as a gamer, I've seen that many, as quite a lot of us who have played more and more games, we get more and more picky of what games we actually want to play and what's, what fair. we like, because we find something that we like, and then we have, we 
get, gain more experience on what we actually like in the game. In the in the first, we we don't actually know what kinds what kind of games there even are in the market. So we kind of like everything that, but we might not love anything. But more we play, the more we find our our favorites, and we tend to lean towards that side of the of the game. I pr- game pretty so. much only play Boggle at this point. That's the <laughs> yeah, and, and so as a gamer, I've gotten more picky on what I like, but I, I still play almost pretty much everything. But I might be a bit more strict on how much I think I, I, I enjoy them. But that's not that big of a deal because I play board games to hang out with my best friends, not to play the game. Actually, that's kind of secondary. And then just... as a designer, what sort of things have you learned over the course of, of kind of developing now the fourth the fourth element here? I think I'm I actually, at least uh, getting faster in getting things uh, uh, in polishing and finding the core of the game. And for example, in the decks, on the first first decks that I designed, they were all over the place, and they really weren't balanced. And I'm really glad glad that I <laughs> they weren't released at, in the form that they were in the first first weeks or months of the development. Um, but so I have found uh, intuition on what works and what doesn't. So I don't, don't need to uh, try to find that uh, perfect place as, uh, as hard in play testing. So I, I, have get, I have intuition getting faster to where I want to be basically. And then in the play testing, I see what works and what doesn't and can do really fast changes on based based on those playtest tests, instead of being kind of blind of what am I even looking at? I'm just looking at people playing a game and they might have fun or they might not, but so I'm better at reading people while they're playing and reading my own game while they play it and having the intuition to do faster prototyping down on the down the way. So let's take one of the one of the examples from the new series here, one of the new decks, and you can choose any of them that you want to talk on. But I'd love to hear where the concept, where the mechanic that you're playing with originated from, uh, and how that like walk me through the development process of one of one of these decks that sort of stands out to you. For that, I must pick my favorite from Development of the Street. Uh, They're sharing. so classy. <laughs> sharing so to speak, kickness. So they have a community where they share everything and no one owns anything. So you're free to swap items all around. The idea for this one came from the fact that I just want to design decks for all different players. So some like high interaction, some like high nastiness, some like uh, high randomness. And one of the hardest things that I have uh, come up with is to design high interaction decks with low nastiness. So you can, you could really, uh, you, you're interested in what other players are doing and maybe even influence it in some way, but the other players shouldn't feel like you're attacking them or being really uh, nasty to them. So that's one of the hardest things that I have found to be uh, to design. And uh, Echidnas is, an, I, I really like them because when you use the effect, you always steal a card from other player, but the card that you used to steal the card from the from your opponent, you give that to them. So they can return the favor on the uh, following turn right back at you. So you're never getting ahead by simply stealing. You're only swapping things around. So it makes the game highly interactive, interactive where cards are always uh, changing who, their ownership, but no one's feeling like they're getting attacked too, too badly. So that's one uh, really hard sector to navigate and design to. And I'm really happy how, how the Echidnas turned out. How how did the development go on that? If you got down to the specifics, where would you come up with the, th- with the idea of uh, handing over that, that card so they can return the favor? And then were there any sticking points? Were there things throughout the course of developing that that you really had to fine tune to get it to get it right? I'm I'm not entirely sure, but I think the whole idea for the deck came from the one valued card. So each deck has uh, different values in the cards that are in the deck, 
and everyone starts with one of the one valued cards from the deck. So it can't be too powerful because everyone starts with it and I don't want, I want the game to ramp up, so to speak. So it shouldn't be too explosive right from the start. So we are kind of uh, conservative in that way with the one valued cards so that the game has a solid uh, ramp up to the, to the finish. But for the for this one, I came up with an idea where you can. How, could I make a deck where you could steal a card from others right from the first turn of the game? And o only way that I accept that is that uh, either, for example, the cards have a plus, so you could combo cards together. If it has a plus, you can continue your turn. So either it would have not be able to have a plus, so your turn stops, or then I get the idea that maybe you lose the card that you use to steal the other card from the from the from your opponent and that's the uh, where the and then I just thought how how I could vary this for the different effects for the deck so stealing cards but always losing the cards that you are doing doing the stealing yeah I think that's cool I'm excited to sit down sit down and dive into them so this is going to bridge over into one of the elements of your game that I'm the most fascinated by you have 20 se 27 sets of decks that I can mix together to play against opponents. And all, all of them mix and match. They all work together, right? They change the type of game you're playing. And you have a balance system. On the top of each card, it says uh, how difficult it is, uh, how much randomness is in it, and how mean it is. Where did those three... Correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think I'm correct. And... Where did those three core scaling systems come to, and how do you determine where a deck lies in that range? Yeah, so it has actually uh, four uh, attributes. So complexity. I was very close. Complexity. Well, I'm looking at the card myself. <laughs> well, you also made the game. <laughs> so it's complexity. How hard the deck is to play. It's not how powerful it is, or just how, how easy it is to grasp what uh, the effect does on the card. And then it's interactivity, how much you can affect other players and how much you care what other players do to you on their turn. Uh, then there's the nastiness, uh, how, well, that's quite a self-explanatory, how much I can do uh, bad things to you. Uh, for example, discard your cards, make cards in the market more expensive, steal your cards outright and things like that. And then the final one is randomness, so how may be luck. It's not always, it's not a synonym for luck based because even high randomness can have quite a high skill gap on it. But it, you could say that's luck, but I don't, I disagree. <laughs> so those, uh, uh, these, these attributes, I, I weren't actively thinking about this in the first or the second game, uh, but for the collection where there are already, after, after collection there was uh, 21 decks, so it. Uh, I, I have heard people complaining that it's hard to decide what decks to play with, and it, you you don't, and the game doesn't come with a way to choose them easily. It only only uh, only had the descriptions of the decks on the back of the rule books, but you, if when you have multiple rule books and you have to read all, through all of these to know what decks do you want to play with, uh, I knew that I had to come up with some sort of solution for this, for this, for the players. So the first thing is that uh, uh, I just came up with that maybe we can have simple statistics or these attributes on how, how, how different the uh, decks are. So the co complexity is uh, simple from, came from the fact that I wanted players when they first, the problem become bigger and bigger the more there are decks. So when you have 21 decks, I wanted uh, the first time players to be really easy to see which decks they could, should be playing in the first game. So they can just discard all the uh, decks with high high complexity. You don't even need to know anything more about the deck. If it's hard to play, you shouldn't play it in your first game. Uh, then the well nastiness is really simple. Can you can you mess other players or not? And that's uh, the attributes are, uh, in a way, uh, play, different players want different things. So I, I really found out it, uh, that some players really like messing up with others and some do not, or at least they don't like when people mess up with their stuff. So that was an obvious one to include, how much you can 
uh, mess up other players. And another thing is some people dislike dice, they dislike luck in general, so they, do, they like low randomness in their games, so that's why that's in there. And the interaction is basically because I just found out, found out that I do have decks already in the game that you uh, have to be vigilant on what your opponents are doing and you really care what they do and you may even be able to affect them but not outright messing up with them so that's why I included that one as well. So basically the stats are there based on my experience on which kind of plays games people want to play when they play Day of Merchants and I wanted these to help people play exactly those type of matches more that they, they, they in, enjoy. Yeah, it really reinforces the the sort of core idea you had for Dale of Merchants, a game that can be designed by the player to be a play experience that fits the type of game they are, they're in the mood for. Like when Jan and I played, I think we one of the very first times we played, we grabbed everything that said mean. I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that's how we approached it. Uh, so from your experience, uh, as the designer, as the person that's probably played variations of this the most, I'd like one or two examples for a two-player game, so three decks total, of combinations that are fascinating when you when you pull them together from anywhere in your collection. What are some of the most interesting mixtures that you have? Well, I must start with the classic that we came up with, my friend, when only the first one was released. And it was the only way he uh, agreed to play the Ocelots, which are the most luck heavy in the first game. So only way he agreed to those is if he played uh, with raccoons, Ocelots and chameleons, which means that you're stealing everything all the time. So the uh, luck and chaos from the Ocelots is, gets kind of, uh, it's, it's not the only thing that is luck and chaos but if everything is luck and chaos that's that's the only way he agreed to play with that and we named that uh, accordingly so it's the chaos game when you when you play with those those three and then it's it's mostly i don't that that's what the first one that comes to mind and for the others we my personal favorite way is to usually pick for two player games is one or two nasty decks and one just the free pick of the for the last one and for example with my friend we always well, at least 90 percent of the time we play with the chameleons because it's the favorite decks of of his and and mine so it's basically two decks plus chameleons for us when you when we when we pick decks now with with Dale merchants three is there a is there a combination of three decks in here that that does something really interesting that maybe you didn't expect initially before you started mixing them together well, m- most combo potential with the uh, decks from the from the Delve Masters three is, is uh, I think that uh, Echidnas they have ec- some really really cool combos uh, together with the Magpies. You, you usually you have to guess quite hard uh, or be really really attentive on what other players are doing to be able to guess guess correctly with the magpies because the magpies core mechanic is i'm trying to get a very specific number from your hand correct like magpies from from another player but they're really picky about it yeah they are so i can already see how this is going to combine keep on going this is cool so with echidnas you're uh usually when you steal you don't have that much uh say on what you're stealing so it's quite limited on the scope of what you are able to steal. But to make Echidnas more powerful, because you are actually losing the card and when you use them, you have a wide selection of what you can pick from. So you can first try to scout with the Echidnas and then just go ahead and take it anyway. <laughs> so usually you, you always have an option of not actually taking anything with Echidnas. So you can first say, oh, you have those two cards in your hand. I'm not going to swap any of those. You can keep them and then try to steal them with the magpies. That's horrible. That's, that's and, a terrible combination. I appreciate it. And if you add in, let's say, monitors, you can really cycle through the nasty cards even faster. I like it. I'm excited. Uh, so in the... And 
correct me if there's if some of them are in any of these, but I know there are a lot of unique character cards in the collector's edition as well. Uh, player roles and player abilities. I mean, there's is it only in the collector's edition that those exist? Yeah, the collection is the only one that includes the character cards. And there how are many 50, of those are there? You gave me 55. <laughs> a stack of character cards that that range from easy to medium to hard when it comes to the amount of uh, integration yeah, they have. Well, like, this, look this at that. Tech, yeah. So, if you're watching the video, he's holding up a handful uh, of sleeved character cards, each with beautiful artwork, custom artwork, uh, a wall of flavor text and game changing or game altering mechanics and roles that you can actually play as a character. What went into the development of those? And I got to be honest, I still play easier medium. Your hard ones, they really impact the game. Like there's a lot of thinking that goes into. They are quite mind bending. <laughs> yeah, they really so, are. So my, my favorite games, uh, my, my absolute favorite games, I'm not counting my own games. They are, they're out of this question, are, is Cosmic Encounter. And that's all about different uh, alien powers and combining and trying to get most out, out of yours to outmaneuver your opponents. So uh, even before Devil's Mercy 1 was released, I had ideas for many of these character cards. And we even played with them, but I just thought that the game is uh, more uh, accessible and more easy to approach without without these because we I, I never play with these with first time players. They are only when you have played multiple multiple games of developers or your or your hobby gamer and you're really deep in the hobby and ha like complexity in games in general. But usually even then I like to play a game or two without them. So I have have ideas and scribbling uh, up those ideas all all the way developers one. And, and two, before releasing any of the character cards, and then with the collection, I thought that this is the perfect opportunity to actually release some of these. And well, we came up with 55 of those. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't even tapped. Like, if I'm going to be honest, I have not even tapped into a a small majority of those cards. I mean, there's so many there. When I started looking at the amount of of integration you have when it comes to deck when it comes to player abilities I, I mean this this game has so much modularity it's almost insane how do you keep track of it when designing something like dale of merchants 3 now that you've released uh 20 something decks and 55 player roles all of which work together in interesting ways and because you have that balance system where people can craft their own game experience they don't necessarily have to be balanced across the board like you change the gameplay right things like luck gets higher in certain experiences but how do you go keeping your head around what you've already created and what what exists in your game as you're making something new for it well first thing is that i pretty much remember all the card effects oh sir so you're the, just very the, smart i all, see how all, it is that's a convenient excuse it's just living in the system basically yeah. when you're doing it from day from day to day and just working and working on the same system again and again and more and more you just pretty much rem remember all, all of them and we, when when i don't we have a, i have a massive uh google sheet with all the cards on one card on one row and then i can go look up on effect of, oh that's how it was i kind of remember it differently but i can look up and uh, so memory time <laughs> reaching on that that question then um and i i do creative things right i've done a videographer and photographer for a while i, I do uh different styles of art like it's a different environment but the creative process for a lot of people who are in design there's elements of similarity there so when it comes to designing or working or crafting a new system have you found moments where the amount of stuff you've already created makes it hard to come up with with something new or come up with new mechanics to play with and and if you have experienced that how do you get through it and if you haven't well then just good for you <laughs> well each deck gets more and more hard to create after, uh, for Dale of merchants after the previous one has been completed simply because i i'm really strict on not having uh, two decks that feel similar. I want each deck to have their own unique thing, and you 
you, you can say that, well, for th this card is uh, pretty close to the other card in another deck, but the whole, uh, ho as a whole, the deck should feel quite uh, like their own thing. So that's one of the things, because I'm quite strict on that, it makes each of the new decks harder and harder. And for the question on how do I came up with, or how do I, uh, when I'm out of ideas, well, for almost all games from Dale of Merchants 2 onwards, I thought that that's going to be the last Dale of Merchants games. I have all the decks done, there's no nothing more to do, That the, the 12 decks, that's it, it's complete. And then I go do some other game design and get, come back to this and I, oh, I have an idea for a deck. And then I, it's just one, one simple idea that I can have, for example, could it be possible to steal with the number one card? And then a Kignas were born from just that one idea. I had, and then what would it me mean if I want to protect my cards from other players? And then the kangaroos were born. So it's just one random rogue idea that comes out of nowhere, maybe from other game design that I've been do doing or something like that. And then, then there's 27 decks out of that. <laughs> I like it. That's quite the process. So bridging from this, if people have watched the full 35 minutes, it means they're fans of you or fans of me or fans of us both or interested at least in the conversation we're having, right? These are going to be probably some of your, your core fan group that have made it this far in the video. So give us, to whatever degree you can, a preview of what's next for you. What are the things you have that you're working on? What's coming up? Uh, what should people be excited for down the road? Besides the fact that if people are watching to this point, they're already backing Dale of Merchants 3. They're sold, right? That's that's just a given. Well, first thing, I'm not sure if I have said it anywhere, but I think that Dale of Merchants 3 won't be the last game in the series. So because I had more ideas for the for unique deck, decks, but... Not, let's not th talk about those not right, <laughs> right now. Sure. So. Here's the thing. I'm I'm excited to sit down and see what you've done with Dale Merchants 3 to start digging into the way these are going to change kind of my core game experience and sleeve them all and add them very nicely to my collector's edition uh, and make Jan increasingly jealous. But I'm, you know, and, and we don't have to talk about what's coming down the road. But I like this system so much, I'd, I'd hate to see this be the last one, right? I, I want to be able to keep on playing in it. So I'm glad there's still ideas out there that you haven't explored fully. What, what yeah, else is on the horizon, though? You mentioned uh, other game designs and other things you're working on. Anything there you can talk about? Well, the, it's public knowledge that the, our next game, or at least we are working on a game called Lands of Galzur. And that's an adventuring sandbox game. Where, uh, which has a rich story and a persistent world. So if you do something, the game will remember that you did that. And on the same breath, it's not a legacy game. So you mm. can play the game as much as you want to, and you're constantly greeted with new stuff each, each time you play. And you can even shake up the players who are playing the game. It's, you're going, you're each controlling an adventure. So it's, of course, more more entertaining and fun if you're playing the same character from game to game and same player is playing same character but you can drop people out and in quite effortlessly and doesn't feel uh it doesn't break break the game so it it's not campaign game and it's not scenario game it's just a sandbox where you can go and do whatever you want and that's quite a challenge to create and uh, uh also resulted in quite a lot of time to be. <laughs> uh, it, it takes a lot of time to create that game, and that's why it's it's still not still not ready to be uh, kickstarted quite yet. But we hope that it will be next year. What uh what started leading you down that path? Why why did you go from deck building to to kind of exploring other game avenues? Is this also a do you not like sandbox games as well? And now you're just challenging yourself again. Well. The first game was the of Merchants, which is quite yeah. mechanical. It has a uh, rich story and uh, in world that it, uh, it takes place in, but the game itself is pretty much just mechanics. You play the games, uh, play the cards, play combos, and things. In enjoy the game in that way and uh, fit fit into your gaming group, as we have discussed. Then there's the Dawn of Peacemakers, which is uh, uh, it 
it has a campaign and a story in the campaign, but still you're not actually, uh, the story doesn't affect your gameplay in a way. You, you can make decisions based on the story if you want, but it doesn't, the game doesn't exactly reward you for immersing yourself in the game. So we had uh, wanted to challenge ourselves and try to ma make a story-based game where uh, immersing yourself and listening and paying attention rewards you and you will actually play the game better. And I don't think I have played any game that does that. There's uh, choices and mechanics that you do and then the story is a result of that one. But we are trying to marry those uh, the gameplay and story in a unique way in the in Lands of Culture. Well, and we are I'm extremely excited. excited about the about the game and everyone who has played as the game so far has fallen in love with it and just asking when I can play more and the answer is always when we have when we manage to design and create more content for the game. So the core core of the game, so the engine is ready, but to be able to say that it's an open world game, do whatever you want. It means that the game must have an enormous amount of content for you to be uh, feel like you can do whatever you want. Well, your your description of the game already has me sold. I'm excited. I'm already a fan of the of the stuff you make, so I can't wait to see this this journey into a genre that is where I kind of live. Right? It's the style of game that that is the sweet spot for me. Uh, and I will do my very best to grow the channel so so that when, <laughs> when the time comes, I'll have like a massive audience to go to go kind of show off and celebrate something new. I can't I can't wait to check it out. Um, what you've done in, in your earlier games has my ex expectations really high for the the quality and the skill that's going to go into the production of something like that. Um, so I think I think this is going to kind of lead on to the end again i'm not quite sure how the structure of these interviews are supposed to go we're still playing with it we'll get there sooner or later i appreciate it i appreciate all the time so for the for the people who've made it to this part uh these are going these are going to be your fans right so if you had if you had anything to say to the people who are interested enough to stay tuned in and watch this part uh what do you want to say to them and Along with that, what is the best way for them to stay connected with you, engage with you, be part of kind of your your community? Let's first answer to the later later question. The best way nowadays is our own Discord channel, and you can find a link to that on our website. So that where I hang around almost daily, and you can chat with other other fans of our games and like-minded, friendly people. Uh, in addition to Quackalop's own <laughs> own Discord channel, of course. But for for everyone others listening, I really uh, hope that I, my games have brought joy to your life and continue to do so. That's that's why I'm creating them. Very cool. Uh, and I can link that Discord channel down below um, if I successfully remember to do so when I post this video up. If I don't, just like 15 people tag it and and make me kind of ashamed of myself. Whatever the case, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those people that are still here listening that haven't haven't signed off already, the plan is for me to release some official content on Quackalope on Dale Merchants 3. And then while the campaign's still running, reach out to the Kickstarter community, reach out to my Discord community, and, and do another conversation, do another deep dive with you, answering a, a series of questions kind of from uh, both of our fan bases, right? So having a, a conversation that isn't just the stuff that I personally am curious about. So if you've enjoyed this, uh, stay tuned, either connect with, um, either connect with, with Sami over on his discord or, or through his networks um, or reach out to me and, and stay tuned for kind of the next in the series. Um, whatever the case, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Jesse. I really appreciate them. your your time and love all the things that you're doing I'll, with your, I'll your tell you a secret. channel. You know, I don't even have to post this. All I was doing, like everything I do is mostly just for me. I just wanted to pick your brain on all these things. If people are listening, that's that's great for them. But this was all just for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.